I'm excited to introduce our speakers for this evening. We got Ron Warner and Lisa McKee. Ron has over 20 years of IT and security experience and is a noted consultant, speaker, and writer in the security industry. As president and chief security evangelist at Cyber AAA, he works as a security consultant delivering awareness, performing security risk assessments, and advising small, medium, and large organizations. Um, Ron is just an amazing individual. I enjoy hearing him speak. So we're lucky to have him here today. And then we have Lisa McKee, a senior manager of security and privacy solutions at Protivity. She has nearly 20 years of IT industry experience in cybersecurity, inf information technology, vendor management, privacy, US, and international data privacy laws, software development, and the list goes on. So. Um, Lisa assists companies conducting security assessments, implementing privacy and compliance programs, and managing their PCI oversight. So without further ado, we have cybersecurity tools for your online safety kit, and I'll turn it over to Ron and Lisa. Good evening, everybody. You should now see my screen with the PowerPoint on it, do you? How many of you is this your first with meeting? Either raise your hand virtually or looks like mostly, I'm, I'm checking those who don't have their cameras on to see if anyone's raising their hands. So it looks like mostly experienced. Well, first, foremost, welcome everybody. Happy Cybersecurity Awareness Month. How many of you knew and know that it's Cybersecurity Awareness Month? See Jeannie raising her hand. And Monica, most of you, it's the opportunity sponsored by Department of Homeland Security to help spread the word about cybersecurity. You see, what Lisa and I are trying to do is we don't want a job anymore. Lisa and I didn't talk about this to begin with. I know it sounds weird, but we want everyone to be so cyber safe and cyber smart about privacy that they don't need to talk to us. I don't see that happening anytime soon. Do you, Lisa? No, it's like Groundhog's Day, Ron. We talk about the same things over and over again. Exactly. But it comes back to the fundamentals. And that's what Lisa and I are discussing tonight. Uh, some of the fundamentals, what do we keep in our toolkit for our tools? And it's not just about cyber and cybersecurity. Lisa is a foremost expert in the area on data privacy, or is it privacy? Anyway, we say privacy here, I guess, in the Midwest. We, so we're going to be leveraging Lisa's knowledge of compliance and privacy as we talk through some of these tools. Let's see, you already know who Lisa and I are. Thank you, Amity, for the nice introductions. As we put in chat, we don't have to wait for a Q&A at the end. Um, so what we're going to do, do you mind if I play a little mind game on them, Lisa? Have at it. So thank you very much. This has been our presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, now are your time to ask. See, everyone waits to ask questions until the end. So we're just going to skip ahead to that because that's usually when the really good questions are. Uh, so seriously, this is supposed to be interactive. We have some things we wanna talk about, but if there's a particular problem you need help with, that's the power of WITH. It's a group where we help each other. It's a safe environment. We build each other's careers, help each other's companies. So uh, please, any point, ask questions. These are the rules, maybe no rule rules. I don't know. Um, and Ron, the most important rule is that no question is a silly question, right? Exactly. Thank you, Lisa. Very true. Yes. The only silly question is the one you don't ask. Uh, I remember my daughter did that when she was in high school. She had a question. I'm like, did you ask the teacher? I didn't want to appear stupid. I'm like, Kaylee, you were born with my big mouth. So use it. So why are we here? Lisa, what would you, how would you describe Cybersecurity Awareness Month and, and what people need to know the basics about cyber, cybersecurity, and data privacy. 
Yeah, thanks, Ron. And, and thanks, Amity and Wit for having us back again. I know Ron did and I did this last year and I've really enjoyed it. So we're glad to be back. And Ron, that's a great question. Uh, why is this important and what is it? Um, it? It's because we keep talking about it, right? Cybersecurity is understanding what data you have, where your data is, how the data is protected, both within organizations, but you as an individual. And I know my philosophy is the more that I can educate individuals, on, on these concepts, then they can help educate organizations and we can start, you know, to, to funnel that up to your C-level executives because the more of us at the manager level and at the consultant level and at the bottom of the food chain, per se, that keep speaking the same thing and keep raising it up, eventually, hopefully, we'll get those executives to listen and to take action. And, and it's from the executives creating the culture, but down to the individual level, because it's up to the people to implement it. And we often find that it's just one person can be that weakest link. So at this point, I want you to begin thinking, well, here's the problem statement Lisa and I developed before we get to our poll. The problem isn't that we don't know what to do. We know what to do for cybersecurity. I bet you if I quizzed each of you about cybersecurity, well, first of all, I know 50% of you are going to come back. I don't know anything about cybersecurity, but when I begin to ask you about multi-factor authentication and a lot of the basics, you do know, just to give you that confidence. But are we doing what we know we're supposed to be doing? And that will also be what this presentation is about, is providing you with some different frameworks that you can use in your organization and personally as well. Lisa, you have this concept of security and privacy champions. What do you mean? And how, would, how could an organization use these champions? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question, Ron. The NICE organization actually created this concept and they do it annually as part of the Security Awareness Month. And they actually do it in conjunction with International Data Privacy Day, which is January 28th. And a champion is somebody that's a proponent of uh, uh, and a cyber uh, speaker, right? Speak out for privacy, speak out for cybersecurity, educate and aware others. So somebody who's a champion for it, meaning that they're in favor and trying to promote, you know, best, be good habits around it. It's almost like the idea of train the trainer, if you will, where we're trying to pay it forward, if you will. It's, so this could be a role any of you could take within your organization, even if security isn't your forte, your strength, you can be part of the champion to help spread the word about it. And then not only within business organizations, but within social groups as well. I added in the chat because Lisa, you mentioned NICE. NICE is the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. It's part of NIST. They are, they are very nice as well, but it's just, it's a working group. Because this week in October Cybersecurity Awareness Month is about building that next generation of cyber IT, cybersecurity, and data privacy professionals. So let's open up the first poll. Gets back to start with why. And if you haven't seen Simon Sinek's presentation, Start With Why, definitely recommend it. Yell if you can't see the poll, please. And you can check all that apply. So Ron, there's quite a few items on this list. Are there items that would be areas of concern that are not on this list? Oh, most definitely. It depends on the organization. So cybersecurity, like the legal community, when you don't have an answer, just answer, it depends. Um, and that's why we included the unknown unknowns. If you do have an area where you have a particular concern, you see it as a risk for your organization, please put it in chat. These are based on what we've seen, our research. I'll actually also show you who it is from. 
So Monica, let us know when we have a decent quorum of people who have voted. We have about 20 out of 27 people that voted. So yeah, there's no wrong right answers. We'd love to just for you guys to just be part of it. So if you just pick your, your answers and we can close the polls shortly. And the, we're looking at the forest, not the trees. So you're not disclosing anything about your organization. Yep. This just provides us with a little bit of direction. Okay, so let's, I'm gonna go ahead and share results. Can you guys see the results? Yes, thank you. Okay. So looks like number one winner is data breach unauthorized access. Ron, I gotta say, I'm not surprised regulatory <laughs> non-compliance is number two. Yep. Yes. Privacy, so, I throw in that bucket. Yep. Well, that's so Lisa and I were debating as we were creating this. How do we, where do we put privacy? And it does go across. It's the data breach, losing control of that most sensitive information, whether it's distributed widely or now we're really through unauthorized access. Um, for those who put in unknown unknowns, please put in chat if you have an example of that. I'm just really kind of curious. So Amity, you put in about uh, separation of data, PCI, PII, so the payment card industry. And we did speak last year quite in depth about what is PII. So we're not trying to repeat from last year. Lisa, do you see anything else on this list? that stands out before we dive back into the presentation? No, the only comment that I have is about the business email compromise and ransomware. Uh, mm -hmm. I gave a presentation yesterday with Rob, um, Rob LaMagna Ryder, and we were talking about zero trust privacy. And one of the stats that we shared is that password compromise is one of the biggest issues that we see that lead to those B, uh, business email compromise ransomware that then lead to data breaches. So as we talk about security awareness and privacy awareness and what are things that we can do as individuals when it comes to protecting data and, and protecting against data breaches, it's protecting your passwords, your username and passwords, and wherever you have an opportunity to use MFA or multi-factor authentication. Good. Okay. From the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, I'm curious, how many of you are familiar with this? Hello, Anna. Good to see you. I used to work with Anna. If you are not, so I, I, I forgot to warn y'all, I'm a, a college professor as well as a consultant. I'm going to be sometimes jumping in between the slides and websites because I want to put some of these in the chat. These are just phenomenal resources for you to pull information. It's hard to keep everything up in our, our little logins, but from this year's report came out in May based on 2020 data, they analyzed almost 30,000 different cyber events, about 6,000 different data breaches. They perform very specific data science around it. What I find fascinating with this is how almost always comes back to the people. 85% involves some form of the human element. Um, Lisa, you were mentioning ransomware, phishing. I mean, phishing is so 2010, yet we still see it today, right? Groundhog's Day. <laughs> exactly, exactly. What I found Fascinating. I don't know how many of you may be in the financial sector. Do you want to, who wants to take a guess? In the fin financial sector, the number one cause of data breaches, 44% of data breaches in the financial sector were due to this. What do you think? Any guesses? Yeah, people employed. So, yeah, get back to people, kind of a little hard. Social engineering. It's actually simpler than that. Human error. Oops, I accidentally sent the spreadsheet with all of the PII to the wrong Lisa McKee because I know two of them. I really don't, but I'm not pretending I do. Um, you know, and now I need to declare an event because Lisa doesn't have a need to see this information and technically it was disclosed. So 44%. Ooh. <laughs> 
Remind us, we'll come back to that, Amity. Does your company send out test phishing emails to make sure you are staying on your toes? Um, I have a really fun video for you to watch against it, you know, why you shouldn't do it. So Lisa, did you have, did you see anything else from the Verizon data breach report from your experience in using it at Protivity? Have you um, used it with your clients? Yeah, actually I use it a lot and I use it in my class as well. Um, the big, one of the big, biggest things too for me was uh, misconfiguration. We see oh. a lot of companies going to the cloud. Um, we talk about cloud and a lot of things that we do and it's easy to go to the cloud. But when you talk about that human element, it also comes down to are things configured securely and correctly and things like that. And do people have the right training and awareness for the roles that they're being asked to do. And that was another statistic out of the Verizon data breach report that I found around cloud that was very interesting. But Lisa, we, we've outsourced to the cloud. Don't they, they take care of all of that for us? No, actually, um, it really depends on contracts and, and contractual language, and you should have a, a roles and responsibilities matrix. So those that know PCI, that's a PCI requirement. Um, but I, it's actually something that I recommend all companies that are in the cloud have and that it's clear who is responsible for what. And preferably before things blow up because eventually things will blow up. It's just a matter of time. So you yep. wanna make sure you have those agreements in place prior to that because after the fact it's too late and then it's just finger pointing. The Cloud Security Alliance is another fantastic resource. If you're not familiar with it, uh, for, I forget the exact website. You Google it, it'll come up. CSA. CSA, and um, they provide a report every year. I did a panel with the lead authors of their report a dozen years ago. Ironically enough, the name of our panel was Security Groundhogs Day. I kid you not. But the question was asked of these cloud security experts, what's the best thing you need for cloud security? Their answer, a good attorney. It comes back to the contract, what's in there and what's not. So enough on that. So we, we need the attorneys involved. Um, here's another fun website. And I'm actually going to swap directly to the, the website, if I can remember how to use a browser. Where is this? There we go. This is from Information is Beautiful, updated. And I know we showed this last year. It changes continually. On this site, you can see what are some of the most common types of uh, breaches and who it's occurring to and what are they doing about it, why this is important. Learn from others' mistakes. Use it as the opportunity maybe to show for your organization what you need to do. Uh, what else stands out for you on this website, Lisa? I like the fact that it also tracks privacy incidences. So you can actually hover over these little bubbles, Ron, and, and just pick one so people can see. It tells you what the incident was, what the cause of the incident was. And actually, a lot of these are related to data privacy incidences, which I found, I think it's a great resource for that. The other thing you can do with the tool is you can actually filter at the top. So those that are looking for HIPAA related stuff or those that are looking for PCI type events, you can actually use the filters and filter down more towards something that might be more meaningful to the data type that you're looking for. But I, I, I use this site often and I enjoy that they, you know, they do pull in all data elements. Yeah, thank you for reminding me about the filters. I had forgotten that. So as the title of this talk are security tools. A lot of the tools that we use are actually just websites that we just keep reference, know that they're available because this graphically shows what is happening. Uh, why we also asked you earlier, what are your top security issues? This comes back to what the FBI's top priorities are. Uh, of course, protecting from terrorist attack. I could argue ransomware is a form of a terrorist attack. They're trying to induce fear. And that's what terrorists do. Um, and yeah, we definitely want to have this conversation about phishing. Keep the bookmark in it. Keep the uh, comments coming in the chat, by the way. Uh, foreign intelligence operations. How do we know these foreign governments and foreign entities aren't performing op open source intelligence against our assets? 
We'll show you a resource for open source intelligence here in just a little bit. Of course, number three, cyber-based attacks, supporting uh, local and international partners. Uh, please reach out to the FBI. Uh, if you have questions, they are really here to help. Same thing with the Department of Homeland Security. <clears throat> And we're actually fortunate, Ron, that we have a very active FBI um, mm -hmm. office, field office right here in Omaha. Very true. Yes. If you want the lead cybercrime task force person, his name is uh, Ken Smoots, S-M-N-S-M-U-T-Z. I'm butchering his name. Anyway, send me a note. I'll be sure to uh, send you his contact information. He's very easy to get in contact and he does this on purpose. He wants people to contact them. So previously, so ransomware continues to be a challenge. Uh, as you saw from the Verizon report, ransomware is, is still up 35%. It's on the radar of President Biden as one of the top challenges for the US government. Uh, they just recently had a whole seminar on ransomware. So I'm going to share with you now, actually, one thing I just got from Ken Schmutz yesterday or today. So from the local FBI, I get alerts. And he's not sending them just to me special. I'm part of a mailing list with our area FBI. Is that, that the InfraGuard, Ron? So it, it, it's in addition to InfraGuard. So... Um, I'll have to remember how I signed up. I think I just contacted uh, Ken Schmutz and our Cyber Crimes Task Force, and they just got put my name on lo their list. But this is the alert, or you can just go to the alerts webpage, uh, US CERT, uh, Cybersecurity Infrastructure and Security Agency. So I just put this in the chat. Real life, this is what is happening now with the Black Matter ransomware. So if this is a concern for your organization, if your organization is using LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, and most do as a part of Active Directory, you should be aware um, of how you could be affected. I like it how it goes into persistent, how would they access, if you are running an intrusion detection system prevention, snort signatures, right here, negation, and Lisa, as you were saying before, with passwords, multi-factor. Really often the simple stuff. Um, another really good website on ransomware, again, from the Center or for the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security. This is what we meant earlier when we said the information is there, are we using it? So if this is an area where you're not really familiar. How does ransomware work? What do I need to do to prevent it? Because it happens at all levels. This is not just for organizations. Lisa, do you have any stories regarding ransomware? Yeah, Ron, um, it's, uh, I did have an opportunity and we deal with this a lot um, as consultants and at ProTivity as a consulting firm where people have had pop-up messages on their screen and they ask, what do I do? So the first piece of advice that I would give anyone is there's always the don't click on things if you get it in an email, even if it looks legit, send it to your spam or send it to your help desk or whatever and say, this is a phishing email. It's always safer for them to come back and say, you know, oh, that was a test. Thank you for reporting it. Or no, that's a legit email versus you clicked on it. And after you clicked on it, then it's too late. Um, one thing too, when you see those pop-ups is instantly don't act, interact with it. Again, immediately report it to somebody within your organization. Um, if it's you personally, then <clears throat> you see this at, at, on your personal device. Uh, one thing that I do is I make sure that all of my stuff is backed up um, and backed up frequently. I have a physical hard disk drive that I keep in my safe. I have some cloud storage uh, locations. I have multiple points of backup. So fine, you got my information. I can't can't change that. And I'm certainly, I as an individual, I'm not going to pay your ransom. So I know I've got a backup copy, but that's 
what I do personally. It doesn't work for everybody. Now, there's a great question in the chat, Ron. Uh, should you ever pay the ransom? I'm curious what everyone else who is here thinks. So put your answer in the chat. And no, we didn't create a poll for this. Sometimes we just think of things as we go through. When is it okay to pay ransomware? So Amy just wrote, companies are put in a tough position. Yeah, ransomware generally shouldn't, but it is very complex. So yeah, the one thing too I see in the chat is about backing up your systems. And one thing that we experienced, or I've heard this story about a company that was hit with ransomware, is that their encryption keys were stored in the same data set with the data. So if... Oh. To protect against ransomware, you definitely want to make sure that you have a good infrastructure and good architecture so that your encryption keys for that data are not stored locally with the data that it's encrypting. Because if they are, then the data backup isn't going to do you any good because the keys are compromised. Th that would be like me leaving the keys of my safe in the safe. I mean, it exactly. makes it really easy for me to open up my safe each time. I don't need to look for my keys, but that means anyone else can. Right. So, thank you for the comments, by the way. Yes, of course, Carol, the answer is it depends. The traditional cybersecurity and legal answer. Um, my recommendation when it happens to you, if you notice, well, first of all, practice. Go through an incident response tabletop exercise. I'll show you uh, some at the end if we have a moment. Ask yourself, ask your organization, let's have a pretend session. Okay, so-and-so just got hit by ransomware. What do we do? Well, everything with them is virtual. We re-image, re reload their data, and they're back up and running in an hour, no impact. Oh, good. Okay. What if it happens against a major file share or against one of our clients or customers? So just role play. Have the tabletop. Know what you'll do. Know how you'll answer the question before you ever have to. If it does happen to you, so we're gonna, I'm gonna give you a psychological tip here. It's really simple though. Breathe. Actually from the Department of Homeland Security, stop and think before you click, before you do anything. Breathing is really good. Our brains really like oxygen. Why? You're actually moving from the slow, fast brain to the slow brain. Call for help. Lisa, you mentioned this earlier. We have a slide near the end. If this happens to you, don't feel, oh my gosh, I'm so stupid. I can't believe it happened to us. Reach out for help. Cyber Crimes Task Force with the FBI. Other people here. We have a, a de facto NDA in place with this group, I feel, where if one of the members, if one of you came up to me and said, Ron, we just got hit by ransomware, I'm not going to start blabbing it to everybody. It'll be, you know, nice thing about Nebraska. We really are nice and the handshake still rules. So ask. Uh, that's where I think organizations have gotten into trouble when they try to fix it themselves. Oh, let's see. You Carol, I heard something recently where there was a tool to turn the ransom situation against the attacker. Okay, so if you need to negotiate with the attacker, bring in professionals. It is actually a very professional skill. Um, I have some colleagues I can point you to who do it for a living. And don't, so often we may want to do it ourselves. You can reach out to, I was going back to, no more ransom. Dot org may already have the keys to unlock what you have. Same thing with the FBI. Reach out to them. Re work with your legal department. They may already have someone who can also perform that negotiation with them, with the those who are holding your data ransom, if you are considering needing to pay. But it also okay. becomes part of your strategy. Maybe it? stalling. Yeah, another important, important tip too, Ron, is ensuring that you have skilled and knowledgeable forensic investigators. Oh, come on, Lisa. I once watched CSI. Can't I just get up there and start clicking on the keyboard? Yeah, I took a class on forensics and I promise you I'm not your forensic investigator. So just because someone says they took a class or they might know how to use a tool, um, it doesn't necessarily make them an expert. 
expert in it. And when it comes to situations like ransomware or others, you definitely want to work with legal and law enforcement, but you do need to have a skilled uh, professional that knows how to ensure that that data is protected uh, and managed the way that it needs to be so that if it ever does go to litigation, you have everything, uh, you've protected all the steps of the process. One other tool that you all have with you right now that is primarily used by investigators, your cell phone. What? Take pictures of everything. Document everything. This way you're proving your innocence, by the way. So if it comes up and saying, well, you know, we think it could be an internal attack, you can show it wasn't you, you're not corrupting evidence. When in doubt, don't touch, let the professionals touch the evidence capture as much as you can. And literally, this is what I would do. Let's see. So what, what can we do? Let's open up the next poll. The next section of our talk, and we're going to go through this rather quickly, just provide you with some of the resources because great conversations we are having. There are many cybersecurity and privacy frameworks. And this is really where Lisa shines because I know she's worked with all of these. And then even our sponsor for today, I heard has just a little bit of experience with one of these. So if the sponsor wants to chime in about uh, their knowledge. If Ron, is there a framework that you work with the most? Yes, I tend to leverage NIST mainly because I'm cheap. I don't like paying money. Um, it's freely available, very well vetted. What I learned, even the Europeans now are beginning to use NIST, although it's fascinating because they they want to use it because it's readily available, but you know, yeah, they want to develop their own. But anyway, it, the NIST cybersecurity framework we'll show you in a moment is just a simple way to establish a cybersecurity program. So NIST would be probably the number one, second, the Center for Internet Security that I tend to use, provide a little bit more of the technical detail. Very good. And again, if you put other, what other ones do you use? How about you, Lisa? Do you have a one from here? Yeah, I would say it depends, Ron. Um, I also go to NIST most frequently because it is readily available. It's free, uh, easy to use. I actually participate in some of the NIST working groups, so I'm a big proponent of NIST. Um, very familiar with PCI DSS. I think um, I'm not surprised by the poll results that a majority go to the PCI DSS. The reason why I see that is because the PCI DSS is more prescriptive. It's a little bit more cut and dried as to what the controls are are list NIST and ISO are a little bit more open-ended and vague. So I do see people going to the PCI DSS for that reason. And the advantage of the DSS, well, it's very similar controls to ISO and NIST and everything else, right? The controls really don't change much. But the nice thing about PCI is it also tells you in the ROC, the report on compliance template, what an assessor is going to look at when they come in to audit you. So there's no surprises as to what does this control mean and what's my my evidence to provide, you know, to prove I'm in compliance. Uh, another one that I use and see companies going to that's not on this list is the UCF, the Unified Controls Framework. Um, so I, I have done a lot of work with that one as well. Very good. Yes, there are so many of them out there, and that leads to some of the confusion. Um, Lisa and I have mentioned this. Let me just pull it up. I like to show as well as tell. Any more? More work for you, more resources for you to check out. No, um, As you heard, Lisa is part of a working group with NIST. I've done it in the past. So if you have a particular interest or expertise in any of their areas, you can join their working group and you can be part of the group that defines what is put into these NIST standards. Another reason why I like it, it's, it's not just the U.S. government with blinders on. It's they grab all of the information from whomever wants to help develop these documents. One downside I have to NIST, one thing I don't like about it, um, 
I swear the authors are paid by the word. I don't think they're paid necessarily. So they tend to be very comprehensive, very lengthy, but there's a lot of benefits. There's the publication library, previously mentioned the cybersecurity framework, identify where you identify your hardware, software data, got to know what you got before you can secure it, protect, but it's technology agnostic. They're not going to say you have to use this type of firewall. They're going to say, here's the rules around network protection, around identity, access management. Uh, Lisa, before you were talking about encryption keys, cryptography, um, detecting. How will you know when something bad happens? How will you know you have ransomware? Processes for detecting, then responding and recovering. I, we can spend a whole hour just on the NIST cybersecurity framework. Is there anything else that stands out that you use with NIST, Lisa? I like the fact that NIST has a security framework and a corresponding privacy framework. ISO does as well. ANSI, I write ANSI standards, so I'd be I'd be remiss if I didn't mention ANSI um, has standards out there in this space okay. also. And actually, the PCI DSS references a lot of the ANSI standards for their encryption stuff as well. Um, but yeah, if you just uh, Google the NIST PWWG or the NIST privacy framework, I, it will come up and um, it's very similar to the NIST CSF in that it has five domains. It has crosswalks to things. I did see a comment about that in the chat. NIST does have crosswalks to very to many other uh, industry standards. So if NIST is not what your company uses, but you need to figure out what, what requirements of NIST are equal to you know, ISO, they have documents that do that. Um, so, so that it, when talking about frameworks, the biggest piece of advice I would give is adopt something because something is better than nothing. And equally where you talk about security, my goal is that we're equally talking privacy. So find one that has a complementary privacy framework, and then you have a, 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 a companion of frameworks between security and privacy, and you should be pretty covered. And that's a great point, Lisa, because more and more as a consultant, organizations call me in, perform a security assessment, and as much I'm providing a security assessment with and a privacy impact assessment, uh, because they've never really defined what is their most sensitive data, where is it, what's the impact if something happens to it? So it's just, again, finding the expertise on someone, for someone who has privacy, uh, that background. And fortunately we have Lisa here. So what, what else would you recommend in terms of developing a privacy impact assessment? And I know we don't have slides on it, so we'll just talk about it. Yeah, that's a great question, Ron. And that's actually my dissertation for those that don't know. I'm a PhD student graduating in May and privacy impact assessments and privacy risk is my dissertation project. So I um, recommend starting off with an inventory it's the same thing that you have to have on the security side before you can do anything. You have to know what systems and applications you have, what data you have, who has access to it. And then it gets into like the protect controls and things like that. Um, so inventory is the first thing before you can even begin an assessment. And then once you've done your assessment, uh, going into the risk side of it, looking at where is your risk from your assessment? Where do I have gaps? Where can I fix things? And also I'm going to throw in there the software development life cycle, there's privacy by design. So taking privacy all the way through your SDLC and, and everything else. So privacy really is an equal to security. And Ron Ross at NIST came out and said that when they released the NIST 853 Rev 5, which was exciting for me as a privacy professional. So uh, that's my, my encouragement to everybody is whenever you're talking security, equally think privacy. Right. Um, I want to, because we're slowly running out of time, we'll be happy to share the slide deck with you. We were asked to cover some of the compliance aspects of cybersecurity. It can be its own area if you want us to go into a little more detail, but let's actually just to kind of keep things moving, Lisa, there was a few other tools we wanted to talk about. Sorry, I usually keep up like a hundred different tabs. If you're not familiar with the Center for Internet Security, their critical security controls, again, focusing on 
security, but hey, look at number three, data protection, which is associated with privacy. What I like about the Center for Internet Security Controls is that it does simplify. So even if you're in a small, medium business, you don't have that many, that many resources. They have what are known as implementation groups, IGs, where you don't necessarily need to apply all of the controls based on the maturity of your organization. So again, just another tool that Lisa and I use in our tool bag, depending on the client and the situation. Another fun one. How many of you are familiar with the MITRE ATT&CK framework? So Lisa, how would you describe the MITRE ATT&CK framework? I just want to move the slides over because I want to, I'm going to zip ahead a little bit if you want to talk about the MITRE ATT&CK framework for a second. Yeah, the MITRE ATT&CK framework, it really uh, uh, lays out control areas as well as attack mechanisms. So you can see on here, some of it is just reconnaissance, uh, identifying your victim. Who do you want to go after? Any of us, right, could be a victim. OSINT, Ron, you mentioned OSINT, which is open source intelligence gathering. So just going out to our LinkedIn pages, our Facebook pages, um, any other page that might have information about us is how individuals gather you know, information and do that reconnaissance. And unfortunately, they're using freely available information that we're posting on the internet. So I would I would recommend being very conscious of, of what you put out there, especially on your Facebook page. If you don't have to have your address and your phone number out there, I would highly re recommend removing it or even a birth date and, and other personally identifiable information that someone can use against you. That's what this attack matrix is really outlining is once they get that data, what are other ways that they can discover information or or, you know, attack an, an individual or an organization. What I like about this too, well, it shows the, along the top, this is basically the attacker's life cycle. They start by performing recon, resource development, they gain initial access, and then they execute. They try to make sure they can stay persistent, escalate privileges to be administrator. They try to evade any defenses you have. Etc. the lateral movement going across a network between different systems. Under each of these columns gets into specific attack types. So uh, heard a speaker recently said, APIs are the greatest risk for hacking. What are our thoughts? No, I don't agree. I, yeah, uh, I, I don't agree with that either. Um, they are a threat avenue potentially that if not maintained supply chain we've heard this in the news as far as goods and services where are you getting your libraries from are they from a trusted resource have you checked them for security um, but it often comes back to are you following your processes if you have a re robust change control process in place lisa mentioned earlier the life cycle checks and balances if a coder brings in a process, an API from a third party source, who's vetting it and make sure it stays vetted. So it, there's, it's a, a very subtle answer. What you can do, and I'm, here we go, native API. So since you brought up API, Jeannie, you can actually dive into each of these topics and it goes into quite depth uh, regarding procedures, how they can be exploited. I'll scroll down. You can see all the different types of attacks, how to mitigate against API attacks. So execution prevention, how to detect, and then the laundry list of references. So you know, one that gets me, Ron, is open source code. A lot of companies leverage open source code, free and open source, or FOSS is another name for it. And that is actually where I see a bigger threat than APIs. Mm -hmm. Very true. Yes, the supply chain. This is the solar winds and Kaseya attacks that happened yep. uh, earlier this year. Uh, one other piece, quick tool I wanted to point out. Cheat sheets. We can't know everything, but you should know where to go look. SANS has a really cool list of cheat sheets, many developed by their top instructors. So if you're just learning about cybersecurity, they have their ABC. If you want to know how to use Windows and Linux command prompt or terminal, uh, PowerShell, how to write.
for IT professionals. I'm just going to click on this because I love this one so much. Um, I use this with my students all the time. Lenny Zeltzer is actually the foremost authority in reverse malware analysis, who also stating you need to know how to write as well. So if you have a colleague who's kind of saying, why do I need to know how to write? I say, ask Lenny, he'll tell you why. So another, another tool for your tool bag. But Lisa, let's segue into what else can we do and should we do? Security, your responsibility, everybody. Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Started beginning of the month with Be Cyber Smart. Um, actually, if you are interested, Homeland Security CISA runs a Twitter talk uh, every week regarding each of these topics. For example, today's topic was about uh, developing the workforce of cybersecurity. So last week was about phishing, but this is probably as good a point as any to talk about phishing. So Lisa, what is your experience with organizations who fish their own employees as part of security awareness? Yeah, most of the companies that I work with are, ten, are trending towards that because those tests are the biggest uh, way to, to know if what you're teaching in those awareness classes is sinking in, right? Mm -hmm. You and I talk about it. There's always multiple ways to train somebody. You hear it, you say it, you read it. Um, is it sinking in? And then also it helps identify where your weaknesses are. And a prior company that I worked at, they actually found that their admins were the biggest offenders of clicking on those phishing emails, uh, which I found interesting once they started doing the phishing attacks and, and trending um, so yeah, uh, Ron, what do you think? You said it's not a good idea. Why? It leads to potential negative feelings towards security. We're trying to trick our own employees because we have to sometimes to get the results we expect. You know, we make email look very real, even though we know it's fake. And so some companies have gotten in trouble. Uh, if you're running a phishing campaign, it can have legal involved because a fish once a legitimate one company was doing, but it made a promise, you know, Hey, if you click here, you'll be given a prize just to get people to click. Well, they didn't realize they made a legal agreement with employees who clicked. Mm -hmm. So even though it was supposed to be phishing testing, it ended up being negative to the company. So just being very aware, using it judiciously. Uh, not only do we want to catch employees doing things wrong, but doing things right. So make sure as part of your phishing campaign, you reward those that report a fish to you, or maybe don't take any action, making sure that it's part of the comprehensive security awareness program. That's great feedback about the rewarding those that report phishing. I report them all the time and I never get anything other than a great thank you. You can delete that email, you know, so that's a great, a great piece of feedback. Well, one of the the top recommendations we have, so keep this in your toolbox as well. I don't have it queued up, um, but this comes from the toolkit. If you see something, say something. If you see something, say something. So if something feels weird, so, uh, hey Lisa, I need to go get going. I just got a text from UPS saying the driver can't find me and he's delivering my 55 inch TV. I don't remember ordering a TV, but he says he needs my address and my personal information to deliver it. Something like that. So I was just role playing there. No, I didn't just get a text, but we're finding texting, SMS, other routes of phishing. I'd like to see a show of hands in the chat. How many have gotten phishing through text? I know I get that several a week. Um, so I'd be interested to know how many others. And the other thing too, Ron, is that unfortunately the, the uh, bad guys are making it look like it's coming from local phone numbers and local businesses. And I live in a small town. So when I see the phone number pop up and I know the business owner is my neighbor, it's like, okay, the first time I called her back and she's like, nope, that wasn't me. And I, you know, I, I was happy I checked on her, but then it was like, great, you know. I, it's just, it's unfortunate that they're trying to stay one step ahead as much as they are. Oh, it'll never go away. It's too right. efficient, too low cost. 
So that's why the if you see something, say something is just so powerful of a tool to have because you don't necessarily need to ask a cybersecurity expert. Again, taking it from psychology, removing it from our fast brain to our slow brain, giving our slow brain a chance to process and go, okay, maybe that's not real because they're trying to get us to react, you know, and do things without thinking. So take a moment, breathe and think about it. We always have time to breathe and to think. Another resource to point out to you as part of the Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and you can pull this as part of your whole toolkit. Um, do any of you have to, or do you create monthly newsletters about IT or security issues? So if you're looking for newsletter material, just say, well, you know what? I don't have time to write a newsletter. I really wish I could just copy from someone. You can't. And I know Lisa, you're, you're gonna hit me because it's like, but Ron, you're a professor, isn't that plagiarism? For a school paper, if you do this, yeah, it would be not allowed. But for a business, you can take the articles freely prepared by the Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, and use them within your organizations. They freely give them because they just want to get the information out. Um, that's what you'll see in these different tip sheets. And in fact, from they're written that way, they are, they're intended to be shared. So... Yes, here we go. Online privacy tip sheet. Make it bigger so everyone can see. So if you're sending out a newsletter about privacy, you can use this information verbatim. I would still state where my information came from because it's really good, but this provides you with a lot of the tips. We've often talk about, comes back to the fundamentals. So login protection, using multi-factor authentication, using a password vault, uh, Keeping up to date, so stay patched. Never click, never tell. I like the, these little buzz phrases work well. Know what apps you have. You'll see a lot of repetition. So my encouragement to you today, use these resources as you are building your cybersecurity awareness program. Um, so last poll, and then we're almost done. How do you protect yourself? because it all comes back to what are we doing as individuals? Because that adds up for organizations. Lisa, you were the one when we were developing this poll, you requested monitor statements. Can you provide more detail? Yeah, What's Ron, so just monitoring the health of your financials. So I have a Credit Karma account. It's free. It's a tool that's in my toolkit that allows me to see is everything that's being reported to the credit bureau something that I've authorized. I also lock my credits, uh, credits with uh, the bureau. So if somebody were to get my information and try to do something malicious, I will get a notification and I will actually have to go in and unlock my account uh, before I try to do something. So just monitoring your financials or doing some of those other things that you can do to lock down your information, protect your information, and make sure that you're in control of, of you know, your financial impact. Because to me, the financial Financial side is one of the biggest things, the biggest hit that we can take. Somebody wipes your credit card or, you know, the credit card will, re will pay that back. But if they wipe out your bank account, that's not as easy to get back. Right. You need to spend time to prove your innocence, potentially. Absolutely. And in some cases, it's even cost you a fee. The bank will still charge you some of that that's lost because of your negligence, even though you may not have done anything wrong. I've actually had that happen where I've reported something and they said, OK, we'll refund all but, you know, 50 bucks or 100 bucks, depending on what the amount is. But that 50 bucks or 100 bucks, I mean, that's still money that you lost of no fault of your own. Yeah, it's just that simple step. My mom once asked me, you know, should I have identity theft insurance? It's often actually now provided directly with your credit card, with your banks, maybe with some insurance, other insurance companies. Uh, but if you're spending the time monitoring for yourself, do I need to monitor myself uh, on the dark web? No, not necessarily, unless you are a very high threat target, if you will, maybe the CEO of a very well-known company and potentially, but for most people, if you just watch your stuff, uh, 
look through your credit card and bank statements every month. Um, and that looks like that's the area of opportunity for this group. It's just taking that time to monitor your own purchases. Did I really buy this? Um, yes, password keeper. That's another one. So last pass, key pass, uh, one pass. There's numerous different password keepers you can use. The key with a password keeper, um, make sure that you are protecting your vault, if you will. Have a very long and strong password to get into your password keeper. What I've actually done is I've written it down and I keep a physical copy somewhere. I won't say where, but you would need to figure that out and it's locked, et cetera. And you, it, it would be a lot of effort to get it. Um, and you really wouldn't even know what it is because it doesn't say what it is. But anyway, so this way it's long, it's strong. You don't have to change it as often. Um, NIST actually changed the rules regarding how often do you need to change a password. It's no longer every 90 days. Set it long, set it strong, and you don't need to reset it as often. Anything else regarding multi-factor that you would recommend, Lisa? Just do it. Um, <laughs> Just do it. There you go. Yep. No, um, but I would say do it if given the opportunity. And that counts your bank, that school, that's anything that you have the opportunity to set MFA. Even your Google accounts, Yahoo, whatever, they will give you an opportunity to do that also. If given the opportunity, I would take it. Um, there's another comment in uh, the chat about VPN right? Protecting your online traffic and using a VPN. There are paid services. There are, Ron, are you aware of any free VPN services? I know the one I use is paid. Are they, would you recommend a free one over a paid one? No, because you're leveraging them. You're going through them to get to other websites. So they could then potentially monitor where you're going and what you're doing. So it's kind of one of those things you get what you pay for. That's why you want to confirm that your VPN service, what are they, what have you signed up for? When they change the contract, make sure they didn't change the contract saying, oh yeah, we're allowed to mine your information for data. That could be indicative of a slippery slope. So it's just, I do recommend using one of the, the major, I try to be very agnostic with the different tools that I use, particularly the paid for ones. Um, I use one, comes, came in very handy traveling through Europe, by the way, when I needed to be back in the United States. So uh, just like Lisa said, just use it. Now, let's see, Joan put, don't automatically click approve when you receive a prompt, right? Yes, think, stop, think, collect. And, and, and I would add to that, Ron, I actually got an email today that looked like it came from Amazon that was a phishing attempt that said, hey, we think your account's been compromised. Click here to log in and change your password. So you're right. Don't just click on those. Log in directly to your account. Change it directly through the, you know, the proper form and channels and websites because those emails in, in fact, of themselves could be phishing attempts. So that's a very good point. And I, I love uh, what Janine said about LinkedIn. Yes, don't just click accept. Um, when I'm connecting with someone on LinkedIn, oh, no, by the way, please connect with me on LinkedIn. When you do connect with me, though, please put a little note where we know each other. Otherwise, you may go into the ignore bucket. Um, I, and I'm sure, Lisa, you're the same way. We get a lot of connection requests weekly. Uh, so this is your opportunity to protect, practice social engineer your social engineering technique. So social engineer your way onto my network. It's actually not that hard if I know you. You can just say, hey, I saw you at WITH. You know, great presentation, let's connect. And I see the LinkedIn stuff ha has increased because we're still in an online environment. Not a lot of people are face-to-face. -face. I'm getting more connections from LinkedIn and then they try to sell me something and then that's the most annoying thing ever. So do filter your LinkedIn connections. Uh, I have started doing that and it'll save you a lot of hassle later. A few other resources. Um, so tech support, this is actually for small, medium businesses. You, there may be some students in your area that can help you. Uh, reach out, of course, this community if you need help, your insurance company, your attorney, um, Better Business Bureau. We have a very active BBB in our area with the scam tracker. So if you are a victim or even if they only stole a few dollars, report it. 
FBI, I mentioned it before. I'm going to mention it again, and I'm going to say it till my dying day. Please report to the FBI Cyber uh, Internet Crimes Complaint Center. Even if it's a small amount, it could be an indicator of a bigger type of an event. Um, we do have nine special agents here in the Omaha area who work cybercrime alone. So business email compromise, ransomware, cyber espionage, etc. So please report. If you are a victim of identity theft, you can reach out to the Cybercrime Support Network. This is a group of individuals started by a fantastic lady in Michigan to provide help for those who are victims of identity theft. And again, don't feel bad if you're a victim. You are the victim, anyone you work with. Uh, too often I see in technology, we like to shame the victims. That's why I'm, I'm talking to my techies and just reminding you, know, when you hear of a victim, we are here to help. Um, other resources that you use as far as when there's an issue, Either no, you, not that I can think of. The other thing that I would um, just add on here is just your professional, your local professional groups. Um, this is with a lot of us are members of other groups. So reach out to your, to your colleagues. Hey, I'm seeing this at my company. Did you see that? Or I have this issue. You know, have you encountered it? How did you solve it? Um, Ron, I know you and I reach out to each other quite frequently as we do with others in our, in our, you know, network. And I think that's the biggest, you know, the biggest tool in our toolkit when it comes to some of these things. That is a great way to finish. You know, the best tool we have in our toolkit are each other. We are open for other questions that you may have at this point.